What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Time Off with the Prof. We hope you all are liking these videos. Don't forget to share them with your friends and classmates. We hope you like the timestamps we've added in the description. You can use them to navigate the questions we ask and find answers to those that you're interested in. With that, this is Time Off with the Prof. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to yet another installment of Time Off with a Prof. We have with us today a distinguished lecturer of the Stanford Computer Science Department. Doctor, would you mind telling us your name, your pronouns, and your favorite spot on campus? Uh, my name is Cynthia Bailey Lee, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And my favorite place on campus is um, probably there are little garden spaces behind Memchu and um, it's right in the center of campus and they just managed to be very quiet and serene and so i like going there so thank you for sharing would you mind telling us more about your you know your personal life where are you from growing up what was that like and maybe your academic journey leading you to stanford uh sure so i grew up just down the road in san jose california and um, and, and so I knew Stanford. It always seemed like this very distant kind of Mount Olympus place. So um, it, it still feels that way a little bit to me, even having worked there for seven years now. Yeah, so I grew up nearby. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. My dad was a mathematician, actually. It was probably like 1985 or something like that. Uh, we got an, one of the early Apple computers and um, and we got this magazine and the last page of the magazine had um, a computer program in the basic language that um, on their activity page for kids that was the last page of the magazine that you could type into the computer and then see what it does it was like a surprise. So, um, so I would do that and that was my first introduction to programming was, um, was doing that. That's not really, you know, the, the sense of destiny didn't really start there though. I, um, I thought I wanted to be, um, a teacher for a long time, a veterinarian, um, like a muckraking journalist was something that appealed to me for a while. I got out of my high school newspaper because of that. And then basically in high school, I really needed money. So I thought, well, there's the computer. <laughs> Maybe I could try to make websites or something. This was like when the web had just begun. So nobody had a website, but small businesses in the Bay Area um, including some of my friends' parents' small businesses wanted to just have a page um, that would be like an entry in a phone book, although that's like the time that we were in. Anyway, so so that's what I did and that's kind of how I got back into it. Um, in college, I went to UC San Diego. I thought I'd be a double major in literature and computer science. Um, I ended up with uh, only a minor because I got caught up in a lot of extracurricular things and so a double major wasn't gonna happen. But um, yeah, that's kind of the story. Yeah, I love that that, that, that magazine, the basic, what, a, what an awesome way to get people like involved <laughs> with computers and stuff, that's fantastic. And so I guess from there, where how, how did you end up working at Stanford? So I finished my PhD and I stayed around and taught classes for a little while. Um, at that point I had, um, given birth to twins. So um, near the end of my PhD, so I, I took a little time off, but I did some part-time um, occasional teaching of classes at UC San Diego. And, um, and then this opportunity came up at Stanford. They're looking for someone in computer science who has as much teaching experience as possible for this teaching focused position of lecture. And that's when I really looked back and said thank you my past self for making those decisions because what a tragedy it would have been if i would have made myself less happy then by dutifully choosing research over what i felt drawn to and then when this opportunity came up i would actually be less qualified for it because i would just look like any other successful grad student with a ton of research and nothing else 
and you're a true testament that you can deviate from that expected path and end up even better than where you probably would have been if you had stuck to that remote path. So, you know, as a frosh is coming into Stanford, interested in CS or just exploring, what kind of classes do you teach that they might be able to take? And what would you really recommend for a starting intended CS major? You can start in 106A. I think some students think if I haven't had CS before college, then I can take some, you know, that's the quintessential Stanford undergrad experiences to take 106A at some point. But, um, but maybe being a major is just going to be too intense for me. And, um, and I want to emphasize this, especially because my own story that I started with is like, well, when I was a wee taught, I started typing these programs in BC. <laughs> and I think it feeds into this mythology of it has to be something you started from the time you learned to read and write. You, one of your languages was C programming language or something. And, um, and it's just not true. We have lots of students who take 106A and start there. That's the first experience they've had with programming and end up very successful CS majors. In fact, if you do take 106A or 106B or 106X, you will have the wonderful experience of being taught by our undergraduate TAs, which are called section leaders. And uh, the class I will be teaching this year, which is also something freshmen uh, can get excited about, is our theory course. So this feels more like a math or even a philosophy course. I even think it has sort of a metaphysical aspect to it because we talk about the scope of infinity and having an infinite amount of time or space and what that would mean for the power of computers. So it's a proof writing class. That's why it ties in a lot with philosophy. Yeah, it's it's a very different way of um, exercising the brain within computer science. But um, but I love it's the aesthetic quality of um, of the logic and proof writing. So. And so outside of teaching, is there anything any other kind of work or organizations that you're involved with? Um. <laughs> Yeah, too. <laughs> like students, Stanford faculty get involved in too many things. Uh, so, um, so I am involved in a lot of student groups and a lot of um, work around um, social justice and equity within the tech field. Um, I created a sophomore seminar course. This is something freshmen can look forward to taking next year that um, is called Race and Gender in Silicon Valley, and it looks at how we ended up in the place where um, the tech workforce in Silicon Valley is so lacking in diversity along the axes of race and gender. And, um, and then looking at how folks are, um, are working to dismantle that. Again, professors in just so many lenses and capacities, you know, you're not just a, a lecturer, you're a club advisor, you're in these activities, you're a parent, you have pets and stuff like that. So <laughs> kind of transitioning into our last few questions. Um, we talked about this again prior to recording. The main topic for the Frosh's three books program is centered on grit integrity and character, stuff like that. So we're just wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing from your experience and perspective, what does grit mean to you and, and look like to you? I think most about in grad school after um, I had the twins and I just, um, one of them had a lot of um, health issues related to eating that um, basically meant she just spent like upwards of a dozen hours a day screaming, crying. Um, and so, so it was just a lot. We didn't have any family, extended family nearby. And so, um, so just managing to get enough sleep and take showers and just like basically take care of ourselves was overwhelming much less get any work done on my PhD research. So um, so I really thought that I would drop out and um, so I did reconsider and 
And kind of the thing that kept me going, the grit, was um, the decision that I was, I felt like I was failing and like I deserved to be kicked out of the program. And that's why I wanted to withdraw. And I thought that actually doesn't make sense. Um, I should, if I'm gonna be kicked out of the program, let them be the ones to do it. Why should I withdraw myself? Because I'm afraid of that happening. So, um, so I just kept going, doing as much as I could, which at times was almost nothing. And at other times was a very small amount, <laughs> it felt to me. And, um, and I didn't get kicked out. And um, I, I don't think I can say, you know, and I was as or more successful than anyone else in the program. And there's definitely a gap in my publications um, for a year or two there where things were a little dry. But, um, but I have that degree. And I think that's, um, that's what grit is, is deciding. I often, in my mind, I imagine myself uh, in the middle of the ocean, maybe because I went to school at UC San Diego and it's right there on the cliff next to the ocean. But um, in the middle of the ocean and swimming, and your choices are basically keep swimming or drown. And and the choice you have to make is keep swimming, not because you even believe you will ever reach the shore, but just keep swimming kind of on principle because you just decide you're just gonna go down swimming as opposed to giving up. I agree completely. And thank you for sharing that story. That was very powerful. I know that'll help the these frosh that are, that are coming into Stanford in these uncertain times, you know. I'm certain that you know we, we will all face some challenges and discouragement moving forward with this abnormal school year. And uh, do you have any advice for these frosh and how they can maximize their online learning experience? Um, I would say reach out, reach out, just keep reaching out. <laughs> Even when it seems futile, people don't return your emails because sometimes we faculty are really bad at that. But um, Anytime you feel discouraged, anytime you're working on a piece set and you just feel like you've been banging your head against the wall for a while and not making progress, can't find a bug, whatever it is, reach out to someone. Uh, reach out to your classmates and through the connections that you know, you're making through social programs that university has online. Um, reach out to the course staff. We're here because we want to help you when you're confused. And I think sometimes students feel like there's something shameful about being confused. You know, you know you're really confused when you can't even really formulate a really cogent question to ask. <laughs> And that's actually the best moment to ask for help because that's when you really need it. And so, um, so even if it's during lecture, just putting in the chat saying, I just feel confused right now. Can you expl try explain that a different way? And if you ask that and you induce the professor to try one of these other ways of explaining it or other models or analogies for thinking about the concept, you've helped the whole class because there are other people where that other analogy or model speaks better to them. It's not just you. Is navigating bravery and the ability to speak up over a Zoom lecture is always scary, but I think knowing that there is a huge reward and that, you know, teachers appreciate it, TAs appreciate it, students appreciate it is a really good uh, parting message. So with that, that's all the questions we had prepared for you. We thank you so, so much for joining us, for introducing yourself to the Frosh and helping them feel a little bit more acclimated for the coming fall. My pleasure. 
I really look forward to getting to know everyone online or in person or whatever it may be and whenever it may be. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And we'll see you in the fall.